The sonata number no. 2 in A major sits in the middle of the first trilogy of sonatas published by Beethoven, the three sonatas opus 2. And as such it forms a great contrast both to the F minor sonata which precedes it in the opus and to the C major sonata which follows it in the opus. On one hand the stormy, turbulent clouds and passions of the very compact, very dense sonata in F minor on the other hand, the blazing bravura, brilliant pianistic, almost symphonic writing of the C major sonata, really shining music. And in the middle we have the A major sonata, and I hope you will not consider it um, damning with faint praise if I say that this is the least revolutionary of the three and the most harmonious. It is not easy to find the sonata something which I could say, look, this is something that nobody has done before, even though it is full of invention and it is absolutely inspired music, but as something which is a little bit more relaxed, more comfortable to listen to, perhaps it fills a need not filled by the other two sonatas in the opus. And if you think the three sonatas taken together were supposed to be Beethoven's calling card in Vienna as a composer, and it was important to him not just to have each individual work stand on its own, but also the three to form a whole which would showcase him in all the different facets of his character as a creator and a musician. Like the other two sonatas, it is also in four movements. This idea was quite novel, not the norm. A standard sonata would be in three movements, fast, slow, fast, but in the first three sonatas Beethoven added a fourth movement before the finale, be it a minuet or a scherzo, thus bringing it closer to either a symphonic or a string quartet kind of form, so trying to expand the sonata form. And as we'll see here, he also greatly expands the finale, uh, which is in ronda form, which would normally include three refrains and three episodes, and here we get to five refrains and four and a half episodes plus a coda. So he was also experimenting with form, not just in the sonata as the whole thing, but also inside individual movements. So to speak about the music itself, it starts with a kind of alert call to attention. One feature of the first movement in particular is that there is a sequence of sections which at first don't really seem to mesh together. He introduces an idea, then he abandons it, he writes another idea, abandons that one as well, goes to a third idea, but then later in the movement he will take all these ideas and try and succeed in weaving them together into one very interesting whole. So at first it might seem more like a mosaic than a single narrative, but then once all these ideas have been introduced, we will recognize them all inside the movements when he brings them back and develops them. So after this first um, idea, he introduces a different one. <laughs> important part of this idea is that it is written in a polyphonic way. Voices behave independently, it's not just melody and accompaniment like we had in the beginning of the first sonata, but rather we have one voice, and now we have two voices answering. Now the melody is taken by the bass, and the middle voices answer it. This idea of polyphonic writing, like anything which Beethoven introduces, will become a motif in itself, which he will develop quite a bit later in the movement. So then he brings back our opening call, this time in forte, 
but just once. And he goes back to the second idea. This time starting with the left hand, with the right hand answering. And having had these two ideas, he goes to a third idea, which is completely not connected. It is a brilliant passage uh, alternating between the hands. So I'll play it slowly once. So all of a sudden we had one thing, we had the second thing. All of this, by the way, in A major. He still hasn't moved anywhere, so we're still exploring the home key. And then a third idea. Which brings an element of bravura and brilliance into the music, which it didn't have so far. And then, very quickly, again after just a few bars, this all dies down. something really unusual. We have a written out ritardando. He wants the music to slow down. It's really rare in the beginning of a sonata movement to stop. And we got to a minor key, so we really don't know where we are. And here we have our fourth idea, which is essentially the second subject, which is completely different, worlds apart from anything we had so far. It is personal and expressive and pleading. It's interesting how the left hand climbs up. Step by step, but always with a dissonant inside. This uh, delicious uh, little heart uh, twisting moment, this. It's like a bit of spice in what is otherwise a uh, normal harmonic progression. And it climbs on and on, becoming really desperate. Which is almost the high, highest point in the keyboard, and then the reply to this pleading. This motif comes from. But what a transformation! And just as it came out of nowhere, so does this drama disappear into nothing. He just leaves it hanging there in the open air and he continues with a fortissimo bravura passage in major. So as I mentioned this idea of a mosaic, we have one thing following another. At the moment it's not really clear how things work, but things will come back together later in the movement. This passage is one of the few places in the entire cycle where Beethoven gave us his own fingerings. And he must have had very unusual and very big hands, because he suggests to play it with one hand. This is an interesting point of contention. We could say, well, Beethoven wrote so few fingers inside the scores that we must observe them where they, where they appear. On the other hand, um, for most of us, this passage is unplayable in this form. It's just too, too wide, too far apart, this. Because it's not in this tempo, it's in this tempo. So 
it is an open question. Do we take a slightly slower tempo and make sure to observe the fingering? If those of us who have really big hands can try to play it in tempo with his fingerings, or we say we divide it between the hands and we keep the tempo and not the fingerings. There's no right or wrong answer here, but this is something seeing Beethoven's fingerings, we cannot ignore them. We need to make some kind of informed decision. And then he brings back the bravura passage. And thus he brings the exposition to a close. With something a bit more calm. So we had three different ideas in the beginning, then we had a middle section personal and pleading in minor, then it evaporated and then the exposition finishes first with bravura passages, then with this calm dying down. And then after we repeat the exposition, the development starts once again with our call to attention, this time in a different key. he really shifts gear um, harmonically going from A major via C major to A flat major it is really really very far and now he will work with this motif with a kind of orchestral accompaniment in the middle so on, until he comes to a close. Then from the first idea he goes to the second. And here the development shows its real face. It will be all about polyphony. So he starts with the second idea, which you might remember was polyphonic already in the exposition we had. And he explores it in this different key of F major. He continues swapping hands. Now harmonic changes. And now perhaps the most difficult passage of the entire uh, first movement, he uses once again this idea and, her, and writes it in triple canon. So one voice enters, in the middle another voice enters, and in the end the third voice enters, just with three notes. And we have to play them, these three voices, just with two hands. So he wrote to arpeggiate these notes because he knew that it would be too too large, probably even for his hands. It's only a question, do we arpeggiate up or down? My personal preference is down because I feel it allows us to have both, both voices clearer. Because our ear automatically goes to the upper voice and by playing the second voice, the lower voice, after, we let it still have some attention. Because if we play it before the upper note, the upper note will completely steal all the attention we have and we will not notice the middle voice so much. And he repeats it many, many times in different keys. And then he goes back to the reprise, and the reprise is without uh, big adventures. He just repeats the exposition in the, in the home key of A major, thus bringing the first movement to a close. So 
the, the really interesting things for me in, in this movement is the abundance of different mosaic-like sections, but then how all of them, plus the idea of polyphonic writing, come together um, in the development. The second movement is a kind of rondo. It has a very interesting tempo indication, largo appassionato. So slowly and broadly, but with passion. And if I just play the music, we, not, we wouldn't normally associate it with passion. If, if we think of the appassionato being... This kind of passion, whereas the beginning So we have a choral-like melody. And below it, we have a kind of walking bass. You can imagine celli basses playing it in pizzicato. So why appassionato? It's, it's hard to answer these kind of things, but for me there is a sense of inner glow in these choral procession. So it's a kind of strong emotion which is imbued in the music. So not so much turbulent passion, but rather a passion of emotion which really fills you completely. Then, in the middle of the refrain of the rondo, we have a little polyphonic episode. As you can probably hear, this is all very noble music. It is music which is poised and this kind of walking figure with a very straight back. Uh, reaching a climax. It is also to be said that this kind of writing is quite orchestral. As I mentioned, celli basses here, and this could be either the other string sections, or even brass perhaps, and woodwinds. So this is our refrain. It will come back several times, and in between we have episodes of differing character. The first one is quite personal. And if we speak of orchestration, for me this is an, an oboe line. And the idea of polyphonic writing perseveres, taken from the first movement and the little episode we had in the middle of the refrain. He brings the melody now in the lower voices. harmonically he has a big pause on the Neapolitan chord which is quite a dark chord in the minor key to the refrain. Then the second episode, once again, is polyphonic, but this time in a major key. So as you hear the first voice, then the second, and the third, while 
the other voices continue playing. And after four more bars, we get the only moment of real drama in the movement, when he takes the opening music and writes it for Tissimo and in the minor key. Here. harmonic progression. So from D major we go to B flat major. Until here when the drama again very short lived. It's very real drama. It's not pseudo drama. It's not um, make-believe drama. This is real, real fortissimo, real emotional pain for these few bars. It's just short-lived. The same thing as we had in the first movement where the um, pleading, desperate episode came and went. He doesn't want this sonata to, I believe, he doesn't want this sonata to have drama of a lasting nature. And then the final appearance of the refrain will be with a variation in the middle voice. Also, it has lost a little bit of its poise. It's not so deep anymore, but it's slightly, maybe slightly more playful. And then after it, a farewell. Even this is polyphonic. This is one voice. And this is another voice. The scherzo, which follows this majestic second movement, is light and sparkly. Um, not a lot more to say about this music. It's so open and clear in its character. There is a moment of small personal sadness later on. And this is beautiful. So this motif has a, a motive of three repeating notes. And three repeating notes often feel to us like spoken words because it, 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 it's quite easy to imagine some words being said. And now he takes these three notes and makes them into a whole scene of their own. And just two. going back to the main main material. I find this kind of reworking of motives really beautiful and unexpected because um, the, the time seems to stand still here. Before we go back to the main tempo. The middle section of the scherzo is in A minor, and it is quite a bit more turbulent. There are these insistent, unexpected sforzandi in the second and fourth bars. And again, polyphonic writing. One voice, but there's a second voice. What's interesting, the motive is not one, two, three, one, two, three, but rather it's a block of four notes. Just the fourth note overlaps with the first note of the motive in another voice. So to show that, I think it is one of the reasons why you put the sforzando on the last note. Even 
more. And really harsh dissonances here. And the fortissimo to end it. And as it came, thus it leaves. The finale is perhaps the most interesting movement in terms of its structure. As I mentioned before, it is a rondo, so we will have a refrain and then episodes. But also, as I mentioned before, instead of three refrains and three episodes, or rarely four, here Beethoven gives us five. And there's a sense of him exploring this material, which I'll show now, in almost an improvisatory way. Beethoven was known as a great improviser. He was famed for his improvisations. And there is something in the way he very lovingly works and reworks this really lovely material, which feels it has a bit of a improvisation in it, especially when we get towards the second half of the movement. So here's our refrain. <laughs> The important things for us is there is a passage going up because every time the refrain comes back this passage will be different. And I'll show right, uh, um, a bit later. Then we have this very long jump. It's a really loving gesture. This It's almost like a caress. And then in the middle of the refrain he loving his polyphonic writing So once again, three voices. And once again. Before going back. So even the refrain itself is quite long. It's 16 bars and it has a little middle section of its own. And every time it comes back, all of this will be varied. So the first episode is in 16 notes, we might think, okay, this is a bit more technical, but he writes dolce, so it should still be sweet. But then after a while, it does become a little bit more um, energetic and muscular. With this very perky uh, jump upwards to a sforzando. And higher. And all of a sudden, without even noticing, we have very thick textures. We have big jumps in the left hand. We have octaves. It's, it's interesting how he manages to bring this about without us being prepared for it. It's not like he announced, okay, we're going to have something different. But he starts from a gently flowing music, then he keeps the same pulse but brings in more energy, and then on top of the energy he brings in the thick textures. So we have a transformation gradual and all of a sudden we have something quite different. <laughs> Then from here he goes back to the refrain. So if the first time we had going from here to here, this time the passage starts an octave lower. And I say definitely we can allow ourselves to take time. Every time the passage comes back. Then we have a simple re uh, repeat of the refrain and then we have our second episode which is the minore the one in the minor key which was quite a standard procedure to have a contrasting second episode and here it is quite quite dramatic <laughs> so we have these chromatic triplets and we have almost um, fanfare like or military Alternating hands. And 
thus it goes on for three pages a whole mini drama in itself and after the drama has ended it evaporates towards the high end of the keyboard and then we have a long passage in triplets which is the third time if you were counting. So we had first, then we had, this time what he writes is effectively, so it is technically a scale in A major, but because it is pianissimo and quite soft, the effect is of a glissando, just a glissando which is a scale, so it has both black and white notes, so we can't play it as a glissando, but this is the effect we should strive for, I think. covers almost the entire keyboard which he had. So his keyboard had one more note on the top and four more notes in, on the bottom. So he couldn't go farther than that and still stay in the A major key. So then the little polyphonic episode is also varied. And then we have a third episode after the refrain, which is the same as the first. And then normally the sonata is supposed to end, but instead uh, what we get is a fourth refrain. Mm -hmm. This time the variation is here. And he doesn't repeat it in full, instead he starts improvising, literally, starts looking for different harmonies. Searching. Okay, he came back and now there's something which feels like the coda. You might remember I said there was a farewell scene in the end of the first movement. This is a kind of farewell dialogue. And we would expect it to end somewhere. But instead he just continues. happening. All of a sudden he brings back the, the dramatic triplets from the minor section just this time in E flat, sorry, in B flat major, which has nothing to do with our key of uh, A major. It is way beyond the point in which the sonata was supposed to end, but he still has energy and inspiration to continue. <laughs> on and on. It is almost as if he was playing with the expectations of the audience who would really be waiting for the sonata to end by now and he is sort of joking that like look how long we can still go and there's still material and still music to be explored. But then after um, a few bars of that he does indeed evaporate and we have a fifth refrain. with beautiful arabesque-like variation here. A variation here as well. This is beautiful. And here, perhaps the audience would already have been expecting him to go on, because who knows, maybe he has a sixth refrain in mind, but here, once again, he disappoints the expectations and he does end the sonata. There is a little coda, very modest. And 
thus without any fuss the sonata ends. So as I said at the very beginning, it is a really harmonious work. It is not a work which um, crushes us or shatters us, but it's a work which gives a huge lot of well-being and warmth in a kind of very personal, humane way.